Welcome to today's webinar, Fix the Future Now with Signal Simulators, brought to you by GPS World and our sponsor, NAVCOM. I'm Diane Safranik from North Coast Media, publisher of GPS World Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. The recording will be available 24 hours from now on our website, gpsworld.com slash webinars. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice in the lower left-hand corner of your console that there is a Submit button. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in queue. Questions that were submitted during registration may be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of GPS World Magazine or in one of our weekly e-newsletters. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, Select Help to submit your issue, and Assistant Producer Joelle Harms or I will personally assist you. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, GPS World Publisher and Editor-in-Chief, Alan Cameron. Thanks very much, Diane. And thank you to our sponsor, NAVCOM, a John Deere company, sponsor of the series of 2015 webinars. Our topic today is Fix the Future Now with Signal Simulators. The title of the webinar is perhaps a bit whimsical. Of course, we can't fix everything in the future. But as I was planning this webinar, I remembered uh, something that I read as, as a kid uh, many decades ago about science fiction. Uh, a science fiction author was uh, saying that with science fiction, we're constantly trying to surprise ourselves, invent new scenarios, and surprise ourselves and see what we come up with. Because out there in space or out there in the future or whatever, the surprised man is a dead man. So th this is not science fiction, obviously. This is real science. But we're still trying to surprise ourselves, trying to test out all kinds of twists and scenarios of the future uh, now so that, and this is with signal simulation, so that we can make our equipment the best that we can to cope with all kinds of unexpected occurrences in the future. And our four speakers today from four leading simulator companies are going to address different aspects of trying to surprise ourselves, trying to uh, simulate uh, in the lab the the possible occurrences that, that, that might happen in the future. Uh, first up, we'll have Mark Wilson from IFAN. He is going to present uh, the material that, that was actually the cover article in this month's issue of GPS World Magazine, Testing for Interference Mitigation. Second, we'll have Neil Fedora from Spirant Federal Systems, who will talk about GNSS vulnerabilities, of which interference, covered by Mark, is, is one, a leading one, but uh, Neil is also going to talk about spoofing multipath uh, segment errors or operator errors and atmospheric errors, how to test uh, for those. Uh, Julian Thomas from RaceLogic is going to focus on a particular upcoming uh, what may be a surprise to some people or to some equipment. There's a leap second coming uh, toward the end of June, I believe, and this has all kinds of issues for GPS and GNSS equipment. Julian's going to talk about that. Finally, we'll hear from Darren Fisher at Spectrocom, and he's going to take us through some anti-spoofing testing, spoofing being another one of the vulnerabilities that is at the top of everyone's mind as GPS and GNSS become more and more tightly integrated into critical infrastructure, whether that's government, financial, aviation, all kinds of things. Uh, there are bad elements out there who are intent on spoofing the system, and how can we test for that and prevent 
that from occurring. Uh, in the fifth section of the program, we will take your questions. Uh, you can submit them online as Diane outlined. Now, without further ado, I'm going to kick the webinar off by turning it over to Mark Wilson, Vice President of Sales from IFIN. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alan. Hello, everyone. And uh, my presentation today uh, is about some actual testing that was conducted last year at DLR in Germany. So it's um, focused on adaptively steered antenna array and receiver for interference detection and mitigation. As Alan said, this is based on a paper that's in the current edition of GPS World, and it's also available from the website. So obviously the time is going to restrict me in going into too much detail, but you can look at that paper yourselves if you wish to. So what I'd like to cover is basically just a little bit about IFON, uh, talk about the potential threats, uh, talk about the adaptively steered antenna, the Galant system from DLR, the requirements for testing, uh, the professional uh, GNSS simulator, interference simulation, and some results and conclusions. So IFIN is a privately owned medium-sized enterprise uh, with 17 years experience in leading edge GNSS technology. And really that experience is embodied in our products, both the GNSS simulators and the SX3 GNSS software receiver and of course in the engineering projects that we conduct for our customers as well. IFIN Inc. was actually established in 2013 to serve the US market. Uh, IFIN GmbH, uh, the German company, is located in Poin, which is just outside Munich in Germany. So potential threats. Um, Alan mentioned leap second rollover, uh, multipath, most evil waveform, interference, and spoofing. I'm sure a lot of these will be covered by um, you know, other speakers. We're going to focus on the interference aspect today and look at the specific testing that was done at DLR. So this is an illustration of the DLR Galant system. On the left you see the receiver and the antenna array. Bottom right is the actual antenna array with four elements and just above that Diagrams illustrating how beamforming techniques are used to um, enhance the wanted signal while at the same time null out the jammer or interference signal. The adaptive antenna array and receiver uh, can be used for detection and mitigation of interference, spoofing, and multipath. Uh, this is based on direction of arrival estimations also takes into account the attitude of the antenna and the vehicle, obviously, and the steering of antenna beams to individual satellites by digital beam forming. So the whole process is based on direction of arrival. This is a, a diagram just illustrating how that works. I won't go into the maths of it, uh, but it's basically we look at the phase difference and delays between the different antenna elements with respect to a a reference or center element as it's described here. This actually gives us quite um, demanding requirements for simulation. Uh, the receiver needs to, be needs to be able to estimate the direction of arrival. Uh, for that, it needs the consistent geometry for all the antenna elements and uh, the distance between the antenna elements. Uh, the attitude of the ray needs to be simulated, and that needs to take into account any lever arm effects on the antenna location. So, for example, most simulators describe motion based on the center of gravity of the vehicle being simulated. Obviously, you need to add in any offset for the antenna location on the vehicle. It's critical that uh, pseudo range and carrier range uh, elements are subject to the same propagation effects and the RF signal needs to be consistent with a calculated range within degree accuracy. In fact, we were able to achieve 0.1 of a degree accuracy in the DLR tests. So next slide, this shows a uh, diagram of the actual test setup. So on the bottom left, we have the laptop controller with our control center operating uh, software, which allows the user to input all the different variables into the scenario. Then in the center in, below, in blue, we have a diagram of the actual signal generator chassis. 
uh, showing four independent RF outputs. For simplicity, we just have one module assigned to each of those outputs. It could be multiple modules. Uh, the outputs go into the in individual antenna inputs on the receiver. A little bit about the uh, professional GNSS simulator. It's capable of simulating all the GNSX signals. Uh, very comprehensive and easy to use software. Uh, up to 108 channels per chassis. And the, the chassis may be fitted with four independent RF outputs. In addition, it also has a combined output where all the uh, signals are combined for you know, standard testing. And it's very configurable. So it can be sort of um, you know, configured to meet specific customer needs depending on their requirements. A little bit more detail. As you can see, we cover all the non-classified signals. Uh, it's very high signal quality, which is essential for the, the testing that we're doing, and a wide dynamic range, which allows you to simulate low power scenarios, but also gives you the possibility of including uh, jamming simulation as well. So one of the critical elements is phase accuracy, and basically that's achieved, uh, the intermodular phase accuracy is achieved by uh, an simulating an unmodulated carrier on two modules and then inverting one of the modules so it has a 180 degree phase offset. Obviously under ideal uh, conditions there would be total cancellation. Realistically in the real world there's always some residual error in there. So it's just a diagram you can see uh, before the inversion of the signal and then afterwards. Uh, so there will be some residual error there as we've seen. And then this is repeated then for all the modules at all the outputs of the simulator. The other critical thing for the testing at DLR was to have a calibrated signal so we could take account of things like um, you know, connectors and cable lengths, etc. So there's two ways of doing that. One, one was to have uh, a dedicated PRN uh, based on a geostationary satellite in the zenith direction from the user. However, there are some limitations with that, so IFAN actually added a feature where there would be a special calibration signal uh, to allow the user to use that instead and remove the limitations. Okay, interference simulation. So at DLR, we actually used an internal uh, technique. Uh, so you can use uh, an SBAS or pseudolite signal, deactivate the modulation uh, to simulate a carrier and then configure subcarrier modulation to simulate a two-tone signal. So there's some limitations with that, but in this case at DLR, we were able to simulate a wideband noise jammer. Uh, the alternative would be to use external jamming, uh, which would give you a higher jammer to signal ratio. However, that does lead to some sort of complexity in the testing then. One of the things that can be done is to add a phase shifter in there to give direction to the signals, but again, that can become quite complex for highly dynamic scenarios. So to look at the results from the testing with the Galant system, um, in the, it might be a little bit difficult for you to see, but in the top left is a sky plot, and you'll see a red dot which uh, represents the jammer. And the blue dot next to it is uh, PRN number 22. Now, so the jammer was very close proximity to the satellite. So if you look below the sky plot, you'll see how the beam forming adjusted to eliminate the jammer while still being able to track uh, PRN 22. So there was a drop in the carrier to noise ratio, but it was still able to track the satellite. Now, just to double check, uh, when beam forming was, was switched off for satellite 22, the signal was lost. And then when the beam forming was switched off for the rest of the satellites, it actually, uh, they were all uh, jammed by the interference and signals were lost for all of the satellites. So it's quite interesting that it showed that the beam forming allowed the, the receiver to carry on tracking, while without it, it was um, not, not able to do so. So conclusions uh, show that the, the NAVIX um, professional GNSS simulator with four outputs provide an effective means of testing the Galant system in a laboratory environment. 
And that's key because it can, provides control of the test environment, the ability to repeat uh, tests, and uh, gives you easy access to test data, the truth data, if you like, from the scenario. Uh, using the simulator, it was possible to verify the performance of the GLANT system and demonstrate the capability to detect and mitigate interference. So further information, uh, you know, encourage you to look at the article in GPS World, or you can go to the IFAN website and download a copy of the paper from there. My contact details are there if you need any more information. I will also be at the Space Tech Expo in May this year in Long Beach. Um, I think that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to hand back over to Alan. Thanks very much, Mark. I will hear next from Neil Fedora at Spirant Federal Systems, Inc. He's going to talk about a range of GNSS vulnerabilities. Interference is one of them, but there are several others. Uh, before I turn it over to Neil, I just want to remark that we have uh, a very international audience today. I see uh, people listening in from all around the world, and we are getting questions submitted. Again, you can submit your questions during the webinar via the question function on your interface, and we'll turn to those in the last quarter hour. Uh, now over to Neil, Neil Fedora, Spirant Federal Systems. Thank you, Alan. I really appreciate this opportunity to discuss an important topic inspired in our community, GNSS vulnerability testing. When we say that GNSS is vulnerable, what exactly are we referring to? Going at the bottom right and going counterclockwise, the services in the atmosphere, such as scintillation and solar events, adversely affect code, carrier, amplitude of the received signals causing PBT errors. Similarly, multipath corrupts receivers' PBT solutions as well. Boofing has proven effective in adversely affecting and or falsifying NAV solutions. Interference, as Mark talked about, is a known vulnerability of GSS, sometimes intentional, like a vehicle tracking jammer, others unintentional, like a high-power transmit antenna located next to the GNSS antenna. Finally, the control and space segments aren't error-free, either as potentially global ramifications like the corrupted GLONASS control segment upload that occurred last year, or there's SP faults like the famous SPN49 satellite. These vulnerabilities have been present, have always been present, so why should we be concerned? As Dr. Parkinson has stated, this is a matter of national security. It isn't a concern just for the U.S., but globally because of our growing reliance on GNSS for precise timing, positioning, and navigation. Our communication systems, wireless voice and data networks, cargo tracking, precision approach and landing, financial networks, the list goes on of our dependency upon GNSS. Furthermore, GNSS devices are increasingly being networked the ability to send and receive real-time information to a server or another device. You have your cell phone, which is linked to the cell network. Your car is now networked. The monitoring stations are talking to each other. This opens up the door for a cyber attack on your device. This trend is only going to increase as all the bright people listening on this webinar find more clever ways to integrate GNSS in our daily lives, which isn't a bad thing for us since we do provide quality simulators and innovative test solutions. As in the IP world, there are, threats, there are threats to GNSS as well. I am confident that most of the people listening have had some personal data stolen at some point. I have unknowingly bought airline tickets for strangers. Places where I've shopped at have been hacked, and my health insurance company has their information stolen as well, apparently. It's not a matter of if, it is when a threat, possibly by a hacker, an insider, a terrorist group, will exploit the vulnerabilities of GNSS. It could be as innocent as kidnapping an Amazon drone because you're a signal flying over your house, or as destructive as disrupting timing on Wall Street. People will do it just because they can. It's important that we are prepared to test, mitigate against these. <laughs> Emphasize that this is a growing concern 
incidents are occurring around the world. And just a snapshot of those are shown here. We all remember the 2007 San Diego incident, which happened during our ION International Technical Meeting, where people investigating it actually came to our conference, they came to our booth, and asked us if we were radiating during that incident, which, of course, we weren't. Dr. Todd Humphreys and his students at the University of Texas Austin have been doing some really impressive research on spoofing with powerful demonstrations when they took control of an $80 million yacht in the Mediterranean, or the previous year where they demonstrated at White Sands that they could take control of a drone. Besides the Newark incident a few years back, more people are using personal jammers to hide their whereabouts. As a colleague told me, an officer in the Merchant Marine told him, that ferries across the English Channel cannot reliably depend upon GPS anymore because of the abundance of jammers that are being left on in trucks that they are ferrying. Maliciously, you have the 2014 incident of robbers in Italy using it to hide the cargo whereabouts. There are just too many concerns to ignore these real threats to DNSS. Fortunately, there are numerous mitigation techniques available for reducing the vulnerabilities of GSS. Optimizing the antenna, for example, can help mitigate against some vulnerabilities, especially if the threats are below the antenna where the ground plane and radiation pattern help attenuate those threats. Powerful Spire and SimGen software easily permits inclusion of antenna patterns and lever arms within the scenario for incorporating these effects in your testing. In addition, a control reception pattern antenna could be used as an effective pre-correlation anti-interference technique. Using a multi-element multi antenna with a antenna electronics unit, holes in the radiation pattern can be produced to attenuate and interfere. Alternatively, beams can be produced to focus the energy in the direction of a desired signal, such as the GNSS signals. We have a lot of experience supporting our customers with these powerful SERPA test solutions. We have solutions which do not include the antenna, such as that shown on the bottom left which uses embedded jammers, along with our GSS simulators. Alternatively, we have solutions optimized for radiating the GSS signals from a multi-output simulator for use in the anechoic chamber to, to permit testing with the antenna and the loop. We even have a patented zone chamber test solution which overcomes the common limitation of chamber testing, which is the test duration, as is shown in the bottom right. All these solutions permit SERPA testing with GNSS signals, in addition to the encrypted codes as well, such as GPSY, PIM, and Galileo PRS and CS. In any solution, accuracy is essential, especially carrier phase alignment between elements across all carriers, namely the desired representative wavefront expected. If interested, contact us. As I'm sure you can imagine, our sales guys will love telling these. The DNSS spectrum is getting crowded, as you can see. Users now have the option of using frequency and constellation diversity to help mitigate against some DNSS vulnerabilities. Using multiple constellations and frequencies, if the signal be jammed or spoofed, those measurements can be ignored, and the mission can proceed using another frequency and or constellation. For example, if GPS L1 CA code is being spoofed, the LAO E1 could be used instead. Or, if GPS L1 is jammed, GPS L2C or L5 could be used to continue the mission. In addition to the commercial codes, authorized users can use encrypted codes such as GPS M and Y code and Galileo PRS and CS for further mitigation against vulnerabilities, in particular spoofing. You can clearly see the value of being able to test using multiple constellations and frequencies, including the encrypted codes, which is why Spirant supports all of these signals in addition to Beidou, Burns, and QuasiZenit. Our new GSS 9000 supports 160 channels on 10 carrier banks, providing full GSS simulation, including the encrypted codes, GPSYM, Galileo, PRSCS, all in a single GSS simulator. Coupled with our SimGen software, the user has full control of the navigation data, multipath effects, constellation orbits, antenna patterns, vehicle motion, et cetera. If you can dream it up, do it. Having this flexibility control helps users investigate improved receiver processing techniques such as authentication, RAIM, and correlation peak monitoring, all of which can easily be tested with Aspire.
GSS receivers are commonly augmented by other navigation aids and systems. Inertial measurement, unit, inertial measurement units, IMUs, have been integrated with GPS for years using various filtering techniques. And JAM or spoof IMUs, which is one of the benefits of augmenting GSS with them. It doesn't have to be inertial. There are other measurement sources and signals of opportunity that could be used as well, such as Wi-Fi, simple data reckoning sensors like a, sensors like a heading gyro, barrel altimeter, Keloran, et cetera. The list just keeps growing. Integrating these sensors into testing is a very effective test capability, such as Spiron Summer Inertial Product, which simulates several commercial and military IMUs and integrated GPS INS test interfaces, like Navigation Grade Honeywell 8764G, shown in the picture on the bottom left. Or there's the Wi Fi Simulator GSS 5300, Sim Auto for simulating automotive dead reckoning sensors, and Sim Barrel for emulating the barrel altimeter. All synchronized and coherent with a GNSS simulation which is essential for accurate integration. Finally, a redundant backup system like ELORAN could be used. We don't have an ELORAN simulator, but, <laughs> but let me know if you need one. It is easy to see how redundancy in navigation and positioning systems could be used, though, for exercising various fault detection, isolation, recovery algorithms. The more sources you have, the more you can use those to aid in filtering out corrupt, corrupted signals themselves. Explain the, vulner explain the vulnerabilities of GSS is a growing concern. You are seeing more and more sessions of vulnerabilities at conferences. For example, almost half the sessions at the International Navigation Conference held this past February in Manchester, England, were devoted to the theme of GSS resilience and vulnerability. The good news for civilians and the warfighter is mitigations are available and improving. Fire understands the concerns and as a result provides unique, powerful test solutions. The flexible GSS 9000 and our SimGen software is a good example of this. In addition to our resilient vulnerability product, SimSafe, and a three carrier ultra wide bandwidth record and playback product, the GSS 6425. We have innovative simulation and test tools to help you with your vulnerability and resilience testing, both now and into the future. For additional information or quotes, here are our contact details. I appreciate everyone. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the next presentation from Julian Thomas. And uh, back to you, Alan. Thank you, Neil. We have a leap second coming up in June. Just what is a leap second? Why is it necessary? And what are we going to do about it? Uh, specifically, what are you going to do about it in, in the audience? Or what can you do about it? Julian Thomas, Managing Director from RaceLogic LabSat, is going to address these questions and more. Julian, take it away. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everyone. RaceLogic have been going for 22 years, and we currently employ 73 people with offices in the UK, Germany, and the US. RaceLogic produced the LabSat Record and Replay Simulator and also the SatGen Signal Simulation software. My presentation will be about the increasing importance of testing the robustness of global navigation satellite systems with respect to leap seconds, interference, and the increasing number of constellations. Let's talk about leap seconds. How long is a day, you may ask? Well, the Earth actually takes roughly two milliseconds longer than 24 hours to complete a full rotation. Over 500 days, this can make a one second difference between the mean solar time and UTC time. This is partly because days are getting longer. So in order to prevent the difference getting greater than 0.9 of a second, leap seconds are added or subtracted. So far, they have just been added as the Earth is slowing down. The Earth's rotation is affected by the tidal effect of the moon. It's affected by earthquakes, which can cause shifting of the center of the mass of the Earth. It's caused by movement of the Earth's mantle with respect to the core. Of course, all of these are random in nature and therefore difficult to predict. Um, as an example, the Japanese tsunami in 2011 decreased the length of a day by two microseconds. Random variations in rotation mean that leap seconds can only be applied with short notice, often less than six months. So this gives GPS companies limited time to test. 
The last leap second was added on June the 30th in 2012. And indeed, this caused some major issues in a number of systems that were using GPS time. For example, 50 Qantas flights were disrupted when the computers crashed throughout their network. And many major websites went offline for a number of hours when their servers crashed. You would think, therefore, that a smoother transition will happen on June the 30th this year, when another leap second will be added. The GPS leap second will go from 16 seconds to 17 seconds, and Beidou will go from 2 seconds to 3 seconds. GLONASS, which transmits UTC time plus 3 hours, should change automatically, in theory. However, our tests have shown that there's certainly going to be problems. Even Linus Torvalds, the Linux creator, said that each leap second event is effectively a one-off and predicts problems will happen again this year. In our tests, we found that two different receivers took 108 seconds before they synchronized. Now, this may seem trivial, but this could cause havoc if different elements of a system use different GPS engines. Synchronization problems can affect many things, for example, banking transactions, air traffic control systems, mobile phone networks, and the electric power phasing of nationwide power grids. This is because electric grids use GPS to maintain the phase between the power plants. If they are out of phase, this will cause instant power cuts. Other problems we saw were due to Beidou being used. We tested a number of multi-constellation receivers from a variety of leading GNSS companies, and we carried out GPS, GLONASS, and Beidou signal simulation for the leap second event starting on June the 30th this year. Every single one we tested showed some kind of problem with the application of the leap second. We narrowed most of these problems down to the weekday numbering of the leap second message. It turns out that the message transmitted by GPS for leap second information numbers the days of the week 1 to 7, whereas Beidou numbers them 0 to 6. Unfortunately, it seems most manufacturers and some simulator companies have missed this fact. And if a GNSS receiver is running on Beidou alone, the leap second can get applied 24 hours too early, which means the UTC time will actually be out by one second for the whole of the day. Other receivers fail to pick up, pick up the leap second message at all from Beidou. The screenshot shows the, the time sequence for an engine applying the leap second correctly on the left, where you can see the seconds can't count past 59 seconds and onto 60. On the right, another engine fails to apply the leap second correctly and rolls over after 59 seconds. Luckily, it is easy to test for leap second issues. What you need is a scenario with simulated GPS, GLONASS and Beidou data from the 29th and 30th of June this year covering midnight. The scenario contains normal satellite ranging messages and includes the various leap second messages. The Beidou leap second message is sent 8 minutes before midnight and the GPS leap second is sent 12 minutes before midnight. Therefore, we have created scenarios which start 15 minutes before. The scenarios can be played back using an RF replay system such as the Labsat. The connected receiver will lock onto the satellite and move forward in time to June this year. That means you can carry out various tests such as turning on and off the different constellations and repeating the test for the day before the actual event. I'm now going to talk a little bit about jamming. Jamming is becoming increasingly common. Why is that? Well, cheap jammers are easy to get hold of. In fact, you can buy them for less than $50 now, even though they are completely illegal. So who would want to use them? Well, people who are tracked and monitored using GPS include delivery drivers who are prevented from working long hours and taxi drivers and also criminal gangs stealing high value cars. There's a recent Sentinel study into jamming, and they used a LabSat to record some jamming events, and this was held just before the Olympics in London. They used the LabSat to record the signals by a motorway, which was next to the runway of a busy airport, and in fact only 60 metres away from the airport's vital instrument landing system. Up to five obvious jamming events per hour recorded, and there was a peak of 120 a month. This plot shows carrot and noise ratio for a selected satellite during an actual jamming event. You can see that it drops in a very definitive way. This makes it easy to detect if the receiver is stationary, but a lot more difficult to detect if the receiver is moving. However, it's likely most systems which rely on timing are stationary. 
Indiscriminate jamming threatens vital infrastructure, so techniques to test and mitigate for jamming are becoming essential in development of GNSS receivers. Again, it is straightforward to test for jamming effects by taking live recordings whilst jamming is being applied in a controlled environment. This allows safe testing on the bench without having to resort to the use of illegal jammers. This allows engineers to develop routines which are more resilient to jamming. I'll now talk about the stability implications from the ever-growing satellite constellations. As we all know, the four major constellations are being upgraded all of the time, GPS, Beidou, GLONASS and Galileo, and they all have ambitious plans for increasing their number. In a GPS engine, processing power goes up proportionally with the number of satellites used in the solution. So during the typical life cycle of a product, the number of satellites may increase by as much as 50%. Therefore, engineers need to test their engines still work with a full constellation of satellites. For example, here we have created a scenario containing the future full constellations for GPS, GLONASS and Beidou, and this was replayed through a LabSat simulator. You can see that there were 34 total satellites tracked, which produced a heavy overhead on the processor. We did this by creating an artificial almanac containing all future satellites, and from this we can create simulated signals from all constellations. This allows engineers to test processor overloading doesn't occur. In conclusion, the work of a GNSS engineer is getting more difficult. As leap seconds are added to the new constellations, GPS jamming becomes commonplace, and the constellations expand in size and function. Therefore, it's very important to have the ability to test these events in advance of them becoming a real problem. That's my presentation. Over back to you, Alan. All right. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I've been reviewing the questions coming in from the audience, and we'll turn to those after our next presentation. I, I see a, a lot of the questions are uh, focusing on <clears throat> excuse me, unanticipated or unpredictable problems, and how do you simulate for something uh, unpredictable. We'll turn to those questions after our next presentation from Darren Fisher, GNSS Market Manager for Spectrocom, who's going to be talking in particular about one of those uh, unanticipated or unpredictable uh, events, which is spoofing. Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alan, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody in the audience. Um, so uh, I'm here talking on behalf of uh, Spectracom. Spectracom is based out of uh, Rochester in upstate New York in the US. Um, we are a traditional uh, background in GNSS. Um, traditionally, Spectracom is, has been a GNSS timing company, the, uh, the when of GNSS. Uh, this long background has led us to branch out into providing integrated GNSS and inertial receivers, um, the where of GNSS, but as we're going to discuss here, into the GNSS test market, uh, the, as I call it, the are, are you sure part of our product range. Now, I've been hearing for many, many years since I've been in this industry about the, the very wide range of uses for this, this wonderful technology called GNSS. But each of these varying applications from surveyors to mobile, from missiles to even guidance for visually impaired, brings its own test challenges. Uh, this is because the, the parameters for success for these varying applications are, are in, in many ways entirely different. So essentially, anybody buying into or integrating GNSS technology into a product or service needs to ask themselves, what, what does the best mean for my application? And simulators are really a key technology to, to ensure that, that you can answer this question for, for your application within the parameters and budgets that, that, that you've been set as part of the project. Now, it is true that many simple tests, and we've heard about leap second from, from Julian just now, but also crossing date line, crossing uh, equator, et cetera, are common across many applications. But, but if you consider a, a few different use cases, um, for example, an automotive user will require a fast 
uh, time to first fix. Nobody wants to sit in a stationary car waiting for the sat-nav. However, absolute accuracy isn't necessarily needed as the system uses the map as a sensor and snaps to map. Moving to another application uh, area, nobody would want to send military or rescue services into a dangerous situation without the very best equipment. In this case, the best means reliable navigation under extreme circumstances. And that's both the physical challenging environment as well as jamming, spoofing, etc. And this applies as much to personal navigation as it does to vehicle or even munition guidance where accelerations and velocities can, can be extreme. Take a third consumer application, um, mobile phones. Well, they can accept relatively poor accuracy and relatively poor availability. But one of the key drivers here is, is, is power consumption. Um, also, there's the increasing legislative approach, so 3GPP, equal, etc., is driving test requirements within the mobile area. So the point here I'm trying to get at is the user doesn't really need to just test GNSS, but, but to test and push the limits and boundaries of the parameters that matter most in their applications to their budget and within an acceptable time frame. And to support this wide range of test requirements in this wide range of applications, there are, there are a range of simulators available on the market, of which Spectrocon is, is one. Um, now, moving on, just to quickly look at the, uh, the product range from Spectrocon, we have a GSG51 is our single channel simulator. So this is typically for very fast uh, manufacturing tests. We have uh, our GSG5 is an L1 uh, frequency multi-constellation simulator. So GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, Beidou, and QZNSS. We have our GSG6, which is our multi-frequency multi-channel simulator. So that's GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, Beidou, QZ, and recently announced IRNSS across multiple frequencies. Finally, the Studio View software is the Spectrocom uh, scenario and test case development tool where the advanced test cases can be created and edited. Now, as, as these GNSS-based navigation systems, integration and techniques that I, we've been hearing about in the first three presentations become more advanced. We're rapidly moving away from seeing GNSS as a standalone technology to one where it is another input into an increasingly complex navigation system, whether that's the advanced SERPA antennas that Mark and Neil were talking about, uh, extra sensors, using infrastructure or data connections for correction data, et cetera. And, as this, and because of this, GNSS test equipment has also moved on from being, uh, back in the early days, a, a sing, simple single point RF test to one where the navigation solution must be tested in a more holistic manner. And you can see here a number of the special test cases where the classic GNSS simulator is at the core, but there are extra requirements and options required on top. Now here, um, as uh, Alan mentioned, I'm going to go into a bit of detail into how one could go about testing uh, spoofing. So in fact, really it's testing your anti-spoof anti -spoof techniques. Um, now, because we chose this topic, one of the questions that the global Spectrocom sales team has been asked a lot recently is, how do I test against spoofing? Um, effectively, the question is, how do I make sure I'm developing anti-spoof techniques effectively? And this question has come from customers in an extraordinarily wide range of applications. 
Um, possibly because as a subject it's been gaining significant press attention in both specialist outlets such as GPS World, but, but also mainstream outlets including TV. And I think we can fully understand, especially with some of the more sensationalist reporting out there, how the idea of a remote vehicle or service being taken over is something that would certainly make the equipment and surface providers worry. And this is really why an effective test and development program would be crucial, because this is a clear and present danger in, in many applications. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about the fact that I'm showing a, a UAV here uh, on the right of the screen. Um, the, this is purely because UAVs have been the focus of much of the press coverage. But as we've already heard from the, the previous three presentations, spoofing can also be as a as significant threat to commercial activity and particularly in applications relying on timing uh, GNS, uh, GNSS for timing functions. So looking at um, a typical spoofing attack, there are varying levels of complexity, complexity from a simple rebroadcast of a false GNSS signal uh, to a far more advanced system where the spoofing signal that is broadcast is synchronized to real GNSS signal and possibly even has accurate information about the location and motion of the vehicle under attack. So first of all, to take uh, the simple case where we just have a very simple uh, unsynchronized attack, this can be easily simulated by uh, using a GNSS simulator. Now, it's not surprising that a GNSS simulator is suitable for this, as they are essentially spoofers, albeit used normally for constructive rather than uh, dangerous reasons. And their very reason for being is effectively to fool a receiver into doing something it is not. So thus, we can simply recreate a simple unsynchronized spoofing attack by replacing the spoofer with a GNSS simulator. Obviously, the advantage here is we have full control over the spoofing signal and can perform many tests subtly changing variables such as the signal strength, the time offset between the simulated signal and the live sky signal, etc., as we probe the resistance of the receiver under test. So once, the, uh, once any weak points have been identified and uh, any techniques been put in place to, to produce a more robust uh, receiver against the attack, this again is obviously then the effective way to verify the fix. Now, while, while this sort of setup would be representative, uh, using LiveSky as one of the signals does have limitations. Uh, for example, it would be pretty tough to, to fly a UAV while it is connected to a simulator. Similarly, uh, legislation would prevent uh, rebroadcast of a GNSS signal, spoofed GNSS signal um, for development purposes, however well intentioned. So while this sort of setup would be uh, suitable for ground based stationary uh, receivers, if we want to start looking at something a, on a roving vehicle, we need to move to something a little more complex. So this sticky issue can, can be resolved with the use of a second GNSS receiver to provide a simulated live sky signal as well as a simulator for the simulated spoof signal. Now in this case, this can all happen while the device under test is actually sitting on a laboratory bench in a secure environment. We can then edit the variable effects of both the live sky signal and the uh, and the spoof signal. This would also remove some of the uh, run to run variables associated with using live sky, such as the constant constant changing of the uh, constellation, 
variable atmospherics, etc. Now, one problem you, you may come across here is as the device under test would be physically stationary, any onboard uh, inertial units would also no longer be physically moving and thus reporting itself as stationary. Now, any integration with a Kalman filter would see a GNSS signal which is telling it it is moving due to the simulated live sky signal, yet it would be receiving stationary data from the uh, onboard sensor, the IMU. To get around this, what we would need to do is also simulate the INS data in a manner that the simulated INS data is coherent with the uh, simulated live sky data. This is uh, one of the one of the uh, ways that the developers can make sure their system is robust against the spoof signal is by looking at a divergence or a significant divergence between the live sky signal and the inertial data. If there is a divergence, then they can possibly start to consider the fact they are being spoofed. Finally, um, simply adding a very simple script capable of running the, uh, the control parameters in the simulators. So for example, a script to run a sequence of tests which would look at variable time offsets between the simulated spoof and the simulated live sky signal or power levels, etc. As well as controlling the device under test, for example, issuing cold start commands to the device under test under test at the start of each test cycle means that complex series of tests with multiple variables could be completely automated and the, the data logged for, for later analysis. Now, moving on to starting to consider a more complex uh, spoofing attack would be the requirement to look at a time synchronized approach. So in the diagram you can see here, a timing receiver would be used to synchronize the real-world spoofer to GNSS time. Um, also in the realm of advanced attacks is the possibility that the attacker might know the position of the DUT, either through some sort of radar detection in the case of a rover unit, or in the case of a base station or timing receiver, having physically surveyed its location. So if the test requirements uh, really did want to be testing with real live sky and a simulated signal in lieu of the spoofer, it is possible to use a secure timer, um, in this case such as the Spectrocom SecureSync as a reference clock for the receiver. Uh, this has a GNSS receiver inside it to uh, synchronize the G GSG to the live sky signal. In a very similar setup to the one for the unsynchronized attacks, the two simulators could be synchronized with, uh, with any time offset between them introduced as required again to allow full lab testing with complex motion and all the typical user-defined variables introduced to uh, the simulated live sky signal as part of the test case. For example, one would increase the, uh, the, the strength of the attack and you are also able to test under degraded uh, simulated live sky signals um, really here, this is to find the limits of the anti-spoof techniques uh, that, that are in place, so one can improve on them and retest. Once again, the use of sensor simulation, uh, so Spectrocom has this feature to simulate coherent inertial data, which is fed into the, uh, the Kalman filter along with the received and decoded GNSS signal to give a coherent navigation uh, me uh, message. Also, this is uh, tied in with the possibility to use simple uh, test control. 
for complete automation and uh, data logging for analysis. So just to uh, conclude, um, we've seen how some of these uh, GNSS simulators, the advanced features and, uh, and their flexible nature can really be used to, uh, to use multiple receiver simulators to test uh, how your simulators would be uh, reacting under varying levels of uh, spoofing attacks. And finally, uh, just to complete, there are my contact details. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to contact me. And uh, I'll pass back to Alan now. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Darren. We now turn to questions from the audience. Uh, I have pulled up our, our first one uh, for our panel, and it's related to something that's going on right now. It's in today's news, or at least in today's GNSS news, and that is we are currently experiencing the largest solar storm of the current 11-year cycle, and it's having some effect on uh, GNSS receivers around the world. Thankfully, nothing dramatic just yet, but it has have it is. We are receiving reports of effects, and uh, one uh, listener wrote in to ask uh, in a similar fashion. He says, "I have friends in Canada who say that GPS goes out regularly for weeks at a time during the aurora borealis. How do you simulate that and predict it, uh, gentlemen?" I throw the floor open to any of you who want to answer uh, questions about solar activity, aurora borealis, and so forth, disruptions to GNSS. Okay, Alan, can I jump in there? It's Julian from Race Logic here. Please do. Um, great. The, uh, the, there's two different ways of uh, addressing this issue. You could either record the actual live sky whilst the aurora borealis is occurring, and then you can replay it on the bench anywhere else around the world at, at your own will. Um, in terms of the, the question asked about how you would simulate it, the uh, Aurora is basically wideband RF noise, uh, quite random in, in nature. So if you're going to simulate it, you would just increase the noise levels in the, in the simulated signals. Um, we have various customers in the northern hemispheres who could probably record this kind of data for us, uh, and we can make those scenarios available uh, for anybody who's, who's using our equipment. Um, in terms of predicting how this effect uh, could happen in the future, um, the only thing I could suggest is the there are two spacecraft, the, the SOHO and the ACE, spacecraft which um, give real-time information about solar data and you may be able to use that to um, to predict something so yeah that's that's my take on it thanks Julian anybody else want to uh, contribute to that one all right we'll Neil, move on I'll oh, go ahead Neil sorry. no just uh, real quick it's the other way that um, you could do this is uh, something that Cornell did back when when they're investigating the scintillation modeling and that's when you have log data. That you use that log data then to replay it back within the simulator um, to modify the code, carrier, and amplitude of the actual transmit signals. And they were able to do this um, and get <laughs> accurate re uh, results from that. And so I think if you're looking for a pseudo range and, and carrier phase changes as a result of the aurora borealis, then that'd be one way that you could do this is using a, a scripted file to play it back. All right. Thank you. Uh, for our listeners out there, we're coming up to the top of the hour. We are going to run a few minutes over so that we can address a couple more questions. So we'll, we'll, continue, we'll continue for another uh, four or five minutes. Our second question, uh, multipath has so many different sources, forms, and effects. How does one put together a testing and verification plan that will address the various sources of multipath? Again, open to anyone which is to answer.
Any one of our panel who wishes to answer a question about multipath? That's a that is a difficult one. This is again the ultimate inspired. Um, you know, it's record and replay devices are you know a great way to capture um, kind of local current date time environmental multipath effects and um, and that's that can be useful if you know that given this current location um, it's prone to multipath effects um, and so if that's you know, something you're trying to mitigate against or test against um, those type of devices are, are useful for that um, alternatively um, our simulators have numerous multipath models included with those and uh, the benefit of those is that you get full control of the actual multipath so if you want to know what the actual signal level is the amplitude the delay um, and that's being used in the simulation and the resultant effect in the receiver that you know that's uh, being affected by it you can then log the information have a known truth so you can control that um, in the lab and, and sometimes the specifications that can be used uh, for that um, but the benefit is it allows you to control those and test it and have that truth available to you yeah so thanks uh, Neil Darren Darren from um, Spectrum here. It's, it, it is a very, very thorny question on exactly how one goes about in a simulator really trying to not, not simulate uh, a real multipath environment, but the question really is starting to look at uh, what effects do you want to uh, mitigate against. So rather than in a simulator trying to recreate a real world uh, scenario, I normally espouse a, a, a method where somebody would actually develop what I would call a mathematically pure uh, solution where you would start to increase the, uh, the difficulty level seen by your receiver by introducing more and more reflected signals of different strengths and different phase offsets rather than trying to recreate a real world scenario because that that is as Julian will probably mention that is much more what a record replay type system is for um, a simulator allows you to start with a nice clean sig uh, signal and slowly layer upon layer uh, more and more and more complex but but importantly known effects and measure the uh, the the result in your receiver All right, thank you. Uh, for our final question, we're going to turn to uh, uh, now Darren covered spoofing uh, in his presentation. Yep. We we have another question uh, about spoofing. Uh, since spoofing attacks can be totally arbitrary and ambiguous, similar to in that way to multipath and and solar activity that we've just discussed, how, how do you envisage the spoofing scenarios while simulating? Well, again, um, so it's Darren again. Um, uh, again, to be honest, the the answer is very similar to the the the, the methodology for um, designing something a, a receiver that can combat multipath. Really, I, I would suggest in a simulator you would start with a a good, steady, well known, well understood, uh, mathematically pure signal. And then you would start to introduce your spoof signal as, as, as per my slides. And I, I would personally start to introduce uh, one effect at a time. So I would start to investigate, for example, how my receiver would, uh, would react to large and sudden jumps in time, um, and then bring those time differences down, um, and then start to build that uh, build into into the equation uh, power level differences. Um, what is the physical? Um, if I'm simulating a different or spoofing a different location, how large is the jump in physical location? Um, and then you start looking at things like um, individual uh, channel uh, signal to strength, signal to noise ratios, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can start looking at uh, some of the phase effects. Um, there, there are an awful lot of effects and internal tricks that one can play, and I think really you need to start with a simple, well-known, uh, well-understood, pure signal, and start to introduce these 
nefarious effects one at a time. All right. Th- th- well, thank you, Darren. Well, just, just, to, just to add to Darren's comments there, I, gu- I guess the beauty of a simulator is that you have control. You can decide what sort of spoofing attack you want. So really that type of attack is down to your imagination. You know, you can sort of imagine the worst <laughs> case attack mm-hmm. and then use the sort of flexibility of a simulator to sort of actually test your device against that attack. Anyone else on the subject of spoofing before we close it out for today? All right. Well, thank you to everyone out in our audience. Uh, We've enjoyed bringing this presentation to you. Uh, Stay tuned next month on April 16th, the third Thursday of the month. Excuse me. Our webinar topic will be Highlights of the GSA, GNSS Market Report 2015, Global GNSS Market Trends and Forecasts. The European GNSS Agency has been doing this annually for a number of years now, and this is the latest version, fresh off the presses. Our presenter will be Mr. Jean Gerardo Collini, Head of Market Development for the European GNSS Agency. My colleague Tracy Cousins, Managing Editor of GPS World, will be moderating, and I invite you to join us on April 16th. Thanks to all our panel, Mark, Neil, Julian, and Darren. Thanks to NAVCOM, our sponsor, and thanks again to you, the audience, for attending. This concludes our webinar. Thank you for attending the Fix the Future Now with Signal Simulators webinar. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the gpsworld.com slash webinars website and will be emailed to you 24 hours from now. Please visit the GPS World website for information about our next webinar on April 16th. Thank you for attending, and have a nice afternoon.